Here we go. Good morning and good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're, you're based. This is going to be an extremely interesting webinar, online panel. We will be talking a lot about laboratory data, testing results, connecting different data pieces together and extracting value. I'm giving a couple of minutes to our participants to join while I will be introducing uh, the panel. We will zoom in the ways in which we can unlock the value that is hidden in laboratory data but also discuss a little bit about what we mean with this term huh? and how we can put data in practice to inform risk pre prevention. Let's start. It's all about testing, food safety testing, but not only food safety testing, testing that is generating insights related to what we find in food, in food samples, how safe is the food that we are consuming and that we are using in products, as well as additional aspects of the food samples that we test in terms of allergens, the presence of ingredients or uh, other aspects in the food that we look at that shouldn't be there and it's a huge business and it's a business that is growing and while it is growing it is also generating lots and lots and lots of data we had this conversation a couple of months ago in uh, one of the workshops uh, that we had on the topic of using data to train AI models and everyone was complaining to me because they said, yes, AI is good, but we really struggle with putting the data together, finding a way, first of all, to digitize properly what we generate through testing, harmonize it, make sure that the different data pieces, they are talking about the same thing and combining them so that we can extract value from a large variety and a large volume of testing data. And this is becoming even more practical. If we look at where these insights may add value. I love this example. It's a quote from a colleague that uh, we had this conversation. It's two or three years ago. And he said, I really think that we are testing in blind. We, we invest so much money in food safety and fraud testing, and we still, I still feel that we are testing for things in blind. We are not sure where should we be focusing on. How should we prioritize uh, what, what we are looking for? And it really, it really uh, made an impression on me. Investing such an amount of money in testing and then still struggling with extracting the value in taking real decisions. And then there is also the other dimension of having access to all the data that is being generated. Another interesting conversation that I had with a colleague, describing the model that they are following that is combining internal laboratories uh, that are generating lots and lots of of testing results with laboratories uh, from a third party that are storing the results in their own systems. And he was telling me that when I'm asking this third party to provide me with access to our data, the data that we have paid for, they want to charge us. They ask for additional money so that we can understand what is the value there, what, what are the testing data telling us. So it can become quite a, quite a struggle. 
putting everything in place and then using it in real decisions. And that's why this panel is here. When people were registering for the webinar, many of them completed the registration uh, questionnaire that I asked them to rank these challenges uh, in terms of importance. And as you can see, many of the people in the audience, they feel lost, unsure in ways in which they can best combine all the data that is being generated and then integrating them in internal systems. This ranked as the number one challenge. And then number two is whether they are testing for the right hazards. Are we looking for something that is of high priority right now? Is there any other emerging risk that we are overlooking? And finally, Another challenge that has to do with the data sitting in plenty of systems, very often from third parties, and being very difficult to access and use. This is why this panel is uh, here, and this is why I've invited this wonderful group of panelists. I will ask you to introduce yourselves briefly and then. Tell us a little bit about why you're here. Why did you find this panel interesting? Joel, would you like to start? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for having me first. That's uh, the first thing I'd like to leave with. But my name is Joelle Masso. I work as Associate VP of Science Programs at Western Farrers. Uh, we have a number of data type programs related to uh, the food safety of fresh produce. Uh, Western growers, for those who aren't aware, uh, we're a trade association. About 50% of fresh produce in the United States originates from members who are part of our trade association. So it's effectively all the specialty crops, lettuce, uh, citrus, nuts, those sorts of things that originate from the Western states of the United States, uh, Western growers represents. And uh, from my background, I'm a quantitative microbial risk assessment person from graduate school, as well as uh, has spent many years at a global testing company, um, thinking about and helping clients use their data or accumulate data um, to be able to try to get to what is that holy grail of uh, food safety management, of using your data to predict and prevent, um, as opposed to just react to. So I'm excited to be part of this panel and to contribute uh, what we've learned at Western Growers with our data sharing programs, as well as uh, my background in, in microbial testing. Wonderful. Alex, how about you? Yeah, likewise, I want to thank you for, for having me on this panel here. So um, I'm currently serving as a global manager for digital quality and food safety at ADM. So it's part of my my, my day to day is looking at our digital transformation and, and automation opportunities within the business, but also what is our analytics strategy? Um, how can we drive continuous improvement um, within the company with a quality and food safety as well as a quality control lens? Um, so at really the last 15 years, my, my background has been in lens implementations as well as quality and food safety um, digital system implementations, and then what's the analytic strategy that, that those can drive from either, uh, mostly from a statistical quality control perspective. So um, really been a passion of mine for, for the last 15 years and, and really what, what, I've, what I've lived <laughs> over the course of my career. So, so very excited to be here. Um, over the course of my career, it's been such a large breadth of different products, different businesses that I've, I've had the privilege to work in from agriculture to, to, to food and beverage to ready to eat type products. So um, excited to be here. Wonderful. And last but not least, Yanis. Nikos, thank you very much for the intro, for the very nice intro. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with, uh, with uh, the panelists that we have to get today with us, with Alex and Joel. And I would like to thank them that they are here. Uh, my background is in the computer science, so I, I will speak more from the technology point of view. Uh, so, uh, however, I felt in love with the food safety uh, domain and the challenges that this domain has very early in my career. So in the last, for more than 10 years now, 
I'm working helping the companies to digitize the risk, uh, monitoring the risk assessment and the risk prevention workflows. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here because I see the struggle on how we can uh, manage and how we can combine all the testing results. And I see also the opportunity of how much this uh, can help in the in improving the risk prevention workflows. It's wonderful to have you, the three of you here. I think that you are the right people for this conversation and the mix that uh, we have around the table is um, very interesting. Um, let me provide a little bit of an intro. I, I was trying to pull together a couple of slides to explain to our audience, even the non-expert ones, uh, to explain them why this is important and why do we talk about such a large variety and a large volume in food safety or quality testing. And uh, my favorite exercise is looking for real, actual data pieces. Eh? And uh, my even more favorite example are the certificates of analysis. The typical outcome from one of the laboratories, I'm going back many, many years, uh, and I remember, I recall the certificates of analysis that my dad was bringing uh, at home because he was working on uh, very, very relevant related uh, topics. They looked old fashioned to me, pieces of paper with numbers. I always thought that computers can do it better. Eh? And here we are today looking again at old fashioned pieces of paper or information. And we are having this conversation about whether and how computers can do it better. And when we talk about uh, testing, food safety plus testing, we are looking about, in essence, uh, understanding contamination, contamination factors and the degree of contamination in different aspects uh, and looking for different types of contaminants and uh, hazards. Uh, so we are talking about a world that is quite diverse and broad. And depending on the area in which we focus, we are dealing with different types of data being generated. Huh? So here with, with a, 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 a very brief uh, research on the types of data that I see being generated, for example, for chemical contamination, I show the traditional pieces of paper or PDF files uh, that I was showing you before, with different ways of expressing what they found in terms of chemical contaminants presence in samples. Different versions of this data being generated up to a spreadsheet that can be automatically produced by LIMS uh, software, you know, like this table that. Uh, I have here as an uh, as an example, very 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 similar. If we look at biological or microbial contamination, although there we're looking at different parameters, different types of contaminants, different methods are being used, and in many cases, understanding uh, if the contaminant that we're looking for is. Uh, uh, the organism that we're looking for is the one that we are expecting or not, it even employs more advanced methods huh? like PCR testing. Lots and lots of additional data being generated. And then if we start looking at ways in which we can, for example, uh, test for the authenticity of the sample, if it contains what we expect it to contain or what it declares that it should be containing them, things can become even more sophisticated and the data types that are being generated can be even more complex. Thankfully, computers have been in place. Thankfully, plenty of software systems have been developed and deployed, but this means that we have many of them. 
It's a whole ecosystem of different limbs, platforms, or databases storing this information. So this is a world that is becoming quite complex. A large variety of very heterogeneous data and with many, many systems in which they are stored. So, Yanis, I will ask for your help to navigate us a little bit into how we can make this world a bit more unified or harmonized. Before I do this, I want to get a feeling from Joel and Alex on what does testing mean in their own lives, in their day-to-day -day practices and in their own worlds. Alex, I will start with you. What does testing mean for you? Sure. So I, I see test results coming from, from multiple facets in, in my experience. Some of them come from the lab, which is the traditional testing. I think we all, all see, but I, I see a lot of test results also coming from the shop floor, whether that could be micro testing that we do on the shop floor, could be inline testing we have operators do, could also be inline instrumentation that I, I really need to gather data from to understand what, what's the, the what, what were the issues on the table? Where's my risk and how am I fun operating on a daily basis? That data I see really supporting both our material sourcing, if we think about the raw material, agricultural materials coming in from a, a grading perspective, but or um, bringing in um, re receipts of new raw materials. But I also see that from a manufacturing operations and, and really supporting that process. Um, think about all, all of these items really from, from a daily basis, I see thousands and thousands of test results every day from across the globe. Um, sometimes they're harmonized, but, but typically it, it's high variability in data, um, different formats, different languages, timeliness of the data is different. It could be real time. It could be a, a week's delay depending on where it's at. So that really influences the consistency in the data and some of the challenges that I, I see on that on a daily basis. Um, to understand also some of the data is structured. It's it's stored in databases in the traditional way that we'd like to see, but but also a lot of the data we get is unstructured data. It's it's COAs, as you pointed out, it's documents, it's bench sheets that are, are manually recorded at our plant. So so how do we get at that data in order to really drive that value and unlock that value we're all looking at from both either a risk management perspective or looking at our lab and facility operations? Local fund structure data, I hear you say, but also data that is coming with different time latencies. Eh? So maybe they come on the time that they are being generated or a little bit after, or they have some delay. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joel, what about you? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to approach it from the current role that I'm in, as well as um, the data projects I'm associated with. So I, I referenced earlier that Western Growers represents a group of growers, and uh, one group specifically has kind of entered into this new paradigm of, of testing and how to use data, and that's leafy greens. Uh, so leafy green salad items um, have historically had a lot of outbreaks and, and issues associated with them when it comes to food safety. And the industry continually just chips at like good agricultural practices, how to implement new methods. And the hard piece is always to figure out ways to assess are our efforts doing anything and where potentially are the risks coming from. So as we do outdoor agriculture, where we have limited ability to predict or uh, prevent some issues is that people often feel like they're in the proverbial kind of like wild goose chase. So a few years ago, the industry uh, banded together and recognized that all the efforts people were doing on microbial testing specifically, so for pathogenic E. coli and salmonella and water testing, so in indicators, there was an enormous amount of data being generated by different laboratories across different vendors with different people's SOPs on how to take a sample, what the samples represent, et cetera, and said, there's got to be a better way. We can learn something from all of these data points. And transition from, yay, it passed my specification, ship the product to what did all of this money and effort mean? So Western Growers created with our partner from Global, um, a data sharing platform that allows the industry to anonymously submit their data and their efforts. And there's been limited at this point, limited requirement to standardize how and where that data is generated. 
that also leads to lots of questions. When you start looking at data from all these different streams is what does it really mean? So this is a relatively new project. It really is that new paradigm that everyone talks about of like, how do we use data more productively? What does microbial testing or just any kind of testing mean in aggregate? as opposed to just reacting to it. And so we're in the thick of that. We now have this platform. We have a couple programs that are on it. There's two, they're both related to leafy green production, the Western Growers Leafy Green Food Safety Data Sharing Program, and then the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, um, Romaine Test and Learn Program. And so we're managing both of these programs for the industry. They are unique and different. But they also are somewhat looking at the same problem. Um, and effectively, you're trying to use this data to verify good agricultural practices, enhance learnings in a much faster time frame, um, to provide context to maybe metadata or things associated with these data points that could teach us something about managing what can be a very high risk product. It is also leading to some really, really productive conversations that we need to be having as a kind of food safety society in respect to understanding origin of data and how you design a program. I think we've been somewhat sloppy slash like just getting through the day kind of thing um, with testing in the sense that we, we do the test, we get the result, we move on. When you start looking at data in aggregate, the critical nature of like why you took the test, what the test could theoretically and statistically mean, and the limits of the test methods and how you got to it, uh, actually have pretty huge implications to interpreting what the results may tell you. And that's what we're getting at uh, right now, which I think is it's great. And there's the exercise in learning how to data share and how to take tests to learn something as an industry. I think that's really formative that we're learning in this project. But I think probably more productive actually is the conversations that we're now having about like, well, we've always done a salmonella test, but maybe they're all not equal. Or how could we standardize what we're doing such that when we are analyzing the data, the first question that comes to mind isn't, do we trust it? And that it's really leading to a lot of really productive conversations in an industry that has, I'd say, more maturity than a lot of other produce um, segments, as well as a lot more complexity. Um, so it's been, it, 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 it's an interesting exercise on many different levels. So I'll, I'll stop there, but that's my experience right now with, with testing data. And, and culture. I really like the fact that you, you talk about how pulling together data from different stakeholders, first of all, requires a new language. How can we describe the data? How can we communicate uh, among us? It serves as a way to verify and inform the practices that we follow when we are producing. But at the end of the day, it puts on the table how we use testing per se. No? This very sophisticated, but also very expensive um, instrument. Amazing. Thank you, guys. That's very, very interesting. And I want to get a, a, a bit of a feedback from uh, our audience as well, in terms of what are they testing for? So. I will ask here for the help of up the magic poll. And I will give you a few seconds to respond to this. What are you primarily testing for? What kind of contamination are you afraid of? What is most important for you guys in the audience? Lots of quality characteristics, I see. Can you also see the results? Yes? Okay. So I see lots of testing in terms of quality, in terms of authenticity, and then chemical and biological contamination. This is where I see responses coming in. Okay, let's use this as input for our conversation. You saw the result, off we go. Yanis, we need a common language and we need ways in which we can trust 
this huge volume variety and velocity of data. Help us understand a little bit better how we can do this. Yeah, I will try to do this in my in the next slide. So in my presentation, I have two parts. In the first part, I will try to describe which are the challenges and how we can overcome these challenges that we have when we try to combine the data. And in the second part of the few slides that uh, I have, I will show what can this unlock, which business cases this can unlock. Uh, and some of them are very relevant to the discussions uh, that we have already. Uh, so how many times you had the, the you needed to, uh, to get a trend for a risk parameter, or you needed to identify uh, the frequency of a parameter and you asked from other systems or from other uh, databases to get an export of the data because you thought that it is easy to combine this data and to answer the question that you the critical question that you had in mind. Uh, it happens to me many times. I, I'm very optimistic in that, but still there are you cannot we cannot do that. Uh, we cannot do that. We cannot combine the different files that we are getting from the systems. Yeah? And although we have already the systems, uh, and we have already the data, we cannot combine them. We cannot har harmonize them. So which are the main obstacles that uh, we have already mentioned some of them? So first of all, it's a very uh, small part of the, of the challenge, but it's still an obstacle. We have different formats of uh, the data. It can be Excel, Doc, PDF format, databases, API, so it can be, the data can be available in different formats. We have both structured and unstructured information. The unstructured information is a bit more challenging. I will sh share an example as well in the next slides. We have different structural information in terms of how the, the which fields are used to describe the information. The so-called metadata, I will also uh, deep dive a bit about uh, it. We have different terms used to describe the same things. So even if the foods, there are so many food uh, taxonomies and vocabularies, vocabularies out there, different systems are using different uh, vocabularies uh, and classifications. And as uh, uh, Alex also mentioned, there are different languages used. So these are the main challenges that, uh, that we see. And although we think that the, mo the, the most important problem when it comes to harmonization and, to co in, uh, and trying to combine the data is to harmonize the data itself, the result, the actual number, this is not the case here. The most important issue is to harmonize the fields, the metadata that are used, the elements that are used to describe our data. And we have very important elements there that are used. For instance, just take a, a very uh, simple example shown in this age ancient uh, slide. We found it at the, uh, at the old years of Agronow. When you need to describe a publication, you need to have the ID of uh, the specific publication, the author, the title, a short description. You need to have the date, you need to have the cut the catalog so it's it's very much the same thing for all the things for all the resources especially the testing resources which are so critical and they have so many parameters so it's about combining the metadata what is needed which is the solution when we 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 need to describe in a unified way uh, the testing resources one solution is to define to specify a unified reference data model. And this has two main steps. The one step is to select the key attributes that we need to describe all the data, the, the testing results. And this may include the date of analysis, the method that was used, the type of the sample, which parameters were, was analyzed, the actual results. So all these are the columns that we see 
in a typical Excel tabular format. But the second very important step is for each of these uh, elements, the data element, the, the metadata elements, we need to define uh, which are the values that are allowed, are free text values allowed, or the, they are controlled values, and it is a specific list of values that we need to add there. So these are the very important two steps to define a unified model that can help us to harmonize all uh, the different testing resource, testing results. So, and how we can, what we need to do is we need to do the mapping of the data that each testing source follows to the reference to this unified data model that I described. Uh, so each uh, data source follows its own data structure, has its own metadata, uh, uses its own uh, formats for units, for dates, for uh, vocabularies, for countries, for uh, hazards and for products and many other parameters. Uh, we need to apply a mapping process that will ensure that each of these element from the original record will be mapped and will be converted to the elements of the reference model. And yes, technology, if the question is if the technology could help in something like that, yet there are semi-automated semi -automated mapping tools that can significantly help and make easier this process. So it is a difficult process, the mapping, it is a difficult process, but it can be supported by technology uh, and by even new technologies like AI. Uh, I will go now to some, some specific examples. So let's start with the example of extracting this, the metadata and the values for each metadata uh, element from the certificate of analysis, the favorites files, that, uh, the favorite files of uh, Nikos. So there, it is even more challenging uh, because there are totally different layouts of these certificates of analysis. As you can see here, uh, there are uh, different elements that are used to describe the same things, like for instance, which was the parameter that was analyzed, if it was aflatoxin or if it was a, a physical parameter. Uh, and this, uh, and even the results, and not only in the values, not only the metadata elements, may be described and may be available in different languages. So we have the challenge of extracting from these documents the corresponding, the relevant elements. And then we still have the challenge to map and transform everything to the reference model. And even if we go to the easier case of uh, uh, do this kind uh, of do this kind of harmonization for files that come from uh, systems that we are using, like the laboratory information management systems. This is here a real example of data of a data export from a LIMS A and from a LIMS B. You can see I'm highlighting here the column of the food that was analyzed, and even the name of the element is in described in a different way. The values, of course, uh, may be very similar in the final meaning, like it's both in both cases, it has to do with uh, wheat or wheat flour, but still the way the values that are used and the language that is used to describe this element are dif different. So this, these are the challenges that we see also in practice when it comes to the harmonization. So which are the, what we, what we can do and which are the typical steps uh, that uh, we can follow in a repeatable and a reliable way so we can harmonize the different uh, data testing results that comes from different testing sources. So first of all, we need to collect all the testing results in one place, in one store. This may be a data lake or any other technology that can be used. And then after collecting and uh, having all this in one store to transform the testing results from the original uh, data model, from the original data, metadata, and the values that are used to the reference 
data model to the unified data model. If we have uh, different languages used in the testing, then we, we can apply uh, a step further translation. This can be assisted by machine translation uh, or it can be uh, it can be also post processed by people to improve the quality. Uh, and after doing that, we need to map also the values from the vo vocabularies used in the original data models to the vocabularies that are used in the uh, reference data models. And after that, in order to make them available, we need to store and index this unified version of the lab tests uh, and make them available in an easy way for the machines to get them and show them in uh, dashboards. So these are the steps that uh, we need to follow. Some good practices that I, I could share here from the work, from similar works that uh, we have done we have done so far is that uh, the, the one thing to use the unified data model is uh, a very important uh, step. Uh, it is also very important for the different vocabularies, for all these different list of values that we have for different data elements to follow standard vocabularies, to follow data standards. And there are already standards to describe the food categories and the foods uh, like the Foodex 2 or the Codex GFSA uh, classification. Uh, there are also standard vocabularies used to describe, for instance, the chemical, chemical contaminants like the CAS numbers. Uh, and also it is important to use standard metrics systems to harmonize results uh, because you need we need to transform the original units to the reference units so we can have something that can be compared uh, in terms of values so these are some good practices and uh, Jan, you talk a lot about the data layer and lots of work that has to go into the harmonization but share a little bit about where you see those this work being put in, in practice and generating value. So if we manage to harmonize all these different testing results that's, that comes with from internal or external data sources, because we have both cases, uh, then uh, we can have some very interesting use cases enabled. Uh, so one of the use cases that I want to share you, the first one, is that we can have interactive risk assessment uh, over aggregated external testing results. In this case, we can harmonize and aggregate millions of sample analysis, results from sample analysis, from many external data sources. And there are such data sources already. These are mainly results, testing results, surveillance results published by the uh, authorities. We can link them to search facets that are based on the metadata taxonomies that we have discussed so far. And this will enable to have real-time analytics and interactive navigation per commodity, hazard, and geography. So it, it's, it is easy then to answer questions like, uh, which is the percentage of samples that were found to be above the regulatory limit for a contaminant like lead in uh, herbs and spices or in a specific uh, uh, material like cinnamon. So this is the one use case. The second use case is that we can combine both the external harmonized data with the internal with the company's internal harmonized testing data and we can have uh, the, we can use the harmonized and aggregated millions of uh, the testing results uh, to link them to search facet that can be used uh, to search and have real-time analytics per commodity hazard and geography so in this case we can unlock even more value because we are taking advantage both the internal, the company's internal testing data from the different testing sources, and the, it may be numerous testing sources, but also we can see what the external uh, 
uh, lab test uh, results are and which are the trends and emerging issues identified there. So I see this, that this builds on, on the first use case and provides even more value. And the third use case is uh, focus on delivering fully the fully harmonized data streams of uh, testing data, of the combined and harmonized testing data to internal dashboards and platforms. So we have all this disconnected data, uh, uh, testing uh, data, uh, either these are files, databases, APIs, uh, we can collect them, uh, securely store them and harmonize all this disconnected testing data with the process that we mentioned earlier. And we can make all the fully harmonized data stream available through a machine inter interface like uh, an API. And uh, the API can be used to integrate this harmonized data stream in internal dashboards that can, can have different facets, uh, as we mentioned also in, in the previous cases, per geography, per ingredient, per parameter. Uh, it can provide aggregated statistics. It can identify trend, comparable statistics. And this can, again, unlock a lot of value when it comes to risk prevention. So these are the three use cases. I would like very much to hear also our panelists what the, what do they think about the use cases. Before going to that, Nikos, I will just share, share uh, which benefits we see working with uh, companies and uh, harmonizing the data and un unlocking the value of the testing data. We see uh, the benefits uh, which are applicable to all the three cases to be focused in three areas. First of all, the safe time, the efficiency. We are doing, we, we are putting a lot of manually, uh, manual effort for processing and combining all these different uh, files. So saving this time is something very important and we can devote this time and focus more on the decision-making part. Time. The second thing is that we can use all this uh, data, harmonized data to identify early food safety risk trends uh, in uh, commodities and key commodities. And with using these uh, emerging issues, these emerging risks to inform the risk assessment and the prevention. And the third uh, benefit that we see, something that uh, Nikos mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of this webinar is that we can reduce the blind, blind testing because we can focus more our testing in the uh, areas where we see that there is an increasing risk or an emerging risk. So these are the benefits. But well, you described three different use cases, eh? external uh, resources, testing results, internal, the combination of the two, and then presenting them in a, in a platform or serving them in a harmonized uh, format um, in, a, in an internal system uh, that will use them. Which one of the use cases is more relevant for our panelists? Alex, what do you think? What did you hear? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of creating that, that common definition or that common data model on, on, we have all these languages that we speak from, from, a, from a data perspective, from a process perspective. What is that single definition that we're all gonna rally around to say, this is how we define, say, say a test result. Um, so, so we all have that common footing now that we can we can sit here and analyze and we can run analytics off of. To me, that's that's key, that's core. So love that, that component of this piece here. Um, so uh, to me, a lot of these pieces are, are I you know the term, um, far fetched, but I, I don't think there's anything here that's not not doable. There's there's some here that are are to me low hanging fruit, and some are just more complex to execute. Um, if we if we utilize the the first use case on on what is a uh, a risk out there that we need to identify and rally around, a lot of times we can we can look at that and and pull that into a singular data model to to what was uh, Giannis was talking about. Easy to easy to define, but but harder to process off of. Um, so to me, that's probably the biggest opportunity I see is starting to tap into those data sources and then start to drive our internal processes off of. 
Um, the next piece is really for me number three and, and starting to create that, that cohesive canonical model inside, start harmonizing all of our internal data. Um, for me, that, that's very doable. Um, in my experience, it's gonna be complex, which, which is no issue, it, but we can do it with common technology and what we have today. Um, for me, what I see a lot of times is, is process creates data and the data drives the process. So it's, it's as, smart, as much as harmonizing our process as it is of harmonizing that data so that we can work in a common way, produce common data against those canonical models. Um, which, which is things that we've done in the past that I've seen be successful. Um, and then how can we, to me then the, the second use case is how can we bring together the best of those two worlds? Um, we, we have the common data out there from a regulatory perspective, and now we have common data internally to bring that together into a cohesive analytic strategy and start to drive insights from there. Um, that's kind of just what I've, what I've taken away from this and, and just listening to be honest, what are some of the notes I've taken? That's interesting. So I hear you highlighting the value of potentially arriving to a common language and making sure that the processes that are generating data and the systems that are generating data, they follow this and they speak into this new language. Absolutely. To me, it's a handshake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Data without process is is dead. We need, we need both in order to create that. that data that without process. Yeah. It's going to be tough. It will have data without process. Joel, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, Alex was pretty thorough in his explanation of what, uh, digestion of what Yana's kind of already presented. I, I think when I look at what we're doing, so we have uh, disparate users contributing to data. There's um, overlays with environmental data that may have been collected for other people that we're kind of at that culmination point of you had to start, and so we were starting, and now you're starting and you're kind of assembling the car as you're driving down the road, and you're realizing, mm, maybe this needs to be improved upon. And I, I, I think the emphasis on deliberate language is so important, um, as well as identifying how to get consistency amongst different groups. So while Alex may represent one company, they probably have one goal, they have consistent expectations, or at least you'd hope, right, across all of their different entities. The program we're running is an industry, and at the outcome everyone's looking for is to reduce foodborne illness from leafy greens. The means to get there and the testing programs designed that, you know, for people's programs are all different. And I think that's so it's one is to, you know, to, to be intentional about the language that you use and what you ask from your laboratories. But then it's also about the method information of how those tests are gen that data is generated and what transparency do we have on that? And how do you get them all into the format? So we're kind of further along in the sense that we are aggregating, we're harmonizing to some extent data. The questions that we're now leading to having had that are how do we get more clarity and more information and more intentionality about testing collection and data collection? Um, I, I loved Alex, data is dead, you know, data is dead if, if you're just kind of collecting it randomly. And like that, that's really true is that if we don't understand the context of a data point, it will tell you anything you want it to. And so that's that's the, the, the threat I have where I see we're, we're kind of at this, I, I'm lovingly calling it the messy middle of going from an industry that in large part received testing results as the finality of something. My product's good, I'm shipping it, save it away, moving on. To a culture that's trying to use the data in the way it really always would you know, should have been used, which is in cumulative to tell you more about a system or risk. This is particularly appropriate when you look at outdoor ag production is you're outside, you need to identify when risks are increasing. Um, is if you're in that middle phase, you're still reacting like it's a final point, but you're also aware of the need to start looking at data in aggregate. The messy middle part is figuring out how you design systems to truly do that. And that is identifying some of the weak points within our kind of food testing 
culture in the sense that like we historically as users of testing in the food industry ask for a salmonella test or a stack test or no one five seven test what we haven't asked is all of the other data associated with what generated that data point what was the sampling methodology what was the incubation time what was the limit of detection we've been really happy with it was not detected well we're, we're leaving on the table a lot of information about our testing point. We are leaving on the table a lot of information about the way that testing is performed. And I hear you describing something that I like a lot, that to do this, we have to be intentional in the way mm -hmm. that we treat what we generate in terms of data so that we incorporate more information than the one that we currently have. Mm -hmm. And that at the end of the day, the systems will support this transition in the middle space, you know, the process that Alex was uh, describing. That's yeah, exactly. Big. I mean, I think it's the, it's the intentionality and the discipline the to recognize what a data point means. Mm -hmm. And then to the point of just creating data to create data, like, that's not very valuable. So how do we re kind of frame how we think about testing to be like, I want a compliant test result to, I want a test result that teaches me something that changes my behavior in the future, that's a very different goal or expectation of a test. And it's a, it's I think we're starting to exercise. Yeah. It's, it's a discovery. Tool. Right. You know, and you're, you have this finite set of resources when it comes to mm -hmm. testing. Um, and really what you want to do is learn from your test so that you can change your behavior. Okay. But yeah. historically, yeah. Like, we, we've used tests to just confirm what we already knew. And those aren't the same goals and how you design your program going forward have to change because of that. So I hear you both describing a journey. And Yanis, I know that you have lots of experience in how these journeys look like. What, what do you hear? What, what does resonate with you and where do you see some, some challenges ahead? Yeah, so I hear very interesting uh, points and things that, yeah, it's it's true that I have seen them uh, every time that we are trying this to solve this harmonization aggregation uh, challenge. So I will, I, I very much, what I hear is that I hear very much that we we need, when it comes to harmonization aggregation, we need to start from the design. So we need to start by adopting when we design uh, our systems, our approach, our workflows, the data workflows, we need to design them following and using data processes. Uh, and also I would say data standards. Uh, I would add also the data standards because the one thing is to have the data processes. I fully agree data without processes is dead but also even if we have processes, but when it comes to the vocabularies, we are using different terms or so variation of the terms. We are not using data standards. I will say only the example of the country. If we are not using the ISO list for the countries and we are using our own list for the countries, this is a small, a small obstacle, but it's still uh, an obstacle that will create delays in unlocking the, the value. So I... I hear that. I hear also very much that we are leaving a lot of uh, information, a lot of data when it comes on how the data is generated. So the provenance, the process, the, the methods that are followed, the conditions, we need more elements uh, to describe in, in a correct way, in a full, in a complete way, I would say, the data to get the value. Because it's not only... And it happens very, very much when you are collecting data from available, public available spaces, because you have only a few of these data elements and it's not possible to extract meaningful conclusions. Right? Okay, uh, lots so, of value that we have because we don't have all the yeah, information. Yeah, That's yeah, 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 yeah. And all the, the process. Uh, and this is, so we need transparency there. Uh, I agree very much. Uh, what can current technologies do we can. I think that I would. I would agree very much with Alex. We have. We have technologies that can solve and can address many 
of these uh, challenges. And we have now even a more mature AI technology that can help to, especially in, the, in a semi-automated way, to help us in the mapping, which if you have thousands of terms, of even hundreds of thousands of terms, this may take a lot of time to do the mapping. Uh, the technology there can help us. We have the technology uh, for the data processes. I think that uh, knowing very well this space uh, for more than 10 years, I still feel that we lack some of the data standards. So for instance, a, a data standard for all the potential hazards that we may have in food, it's still missing that is adopted uh, globally, it's still missing, or it's okay. different between the US and the, uh, and Europe and Asia, for instance. So this is still a challenge. Standards, see. data standards are missing. Yeah, the common language, and then this brings in mind the food safety standards that didn't achieve, didn't arrive at the common language, but at least they have a benchmarking mechanism so that they can translate from one standard to another. Music in my ears, but we are, we only have a few minutes uh, left. I will, uh, I will skip, I have to skip the poll for the audience. I'm really sorry guys, but I give you the, the opportunity to, uh, to send us a bit of feedback. I have a pressing question here that I, I have to ask you guys. We talked about time when were testing data are generated and, and how relevant they are in real time or in retrospective. So how important is real time and insights and information uh, for you? What do you think? Alex, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the earlier I understand the environment and test results, the more proactive I can be. Um, around the, the, the operations. Um, so it, it's it's always helpful to, <laughs> to see something before it happens rather than reacting to it after it occurs. Um, so of course I, I need to understand it after it occurs so I can I can do the appropriate Kappa root cause analysis and correct. Um, but I, I always prefer to have that data and information up front so that we can be proactive about our risk rather than reactive about our failures. Upfront means being able to be more proactive. Huh? Mm -hmm. Joel, what about you? And you were describing an exercise that is quite that introduces quite a delay in getting all the data together and extracting mm -hmm. insights. How yeah, how I mean, much I, does real time matter? I think re real time is is what everyone wants, right? So that they can do exactly what Alex just described. Is that I I want to know in advance when risks are increasing, such that I can modify my behavior and prevent it from happening. Right. Like that's the that's what everyone's going towards. So I'll, I'll provide maybe a different context as well to the value of retrospective data it is that one of the things that is challenging, especially within food systems, is that you can't test every portion. Right. So you are making assumptions about prevalence. You're making assumptions about what your testing program statistical limits are able to detect. If you have the ability to go in retrospect and see what happened, you can better inform data collection going forward. So maybe my, my risk has gone down and I actually need more testing than I used to use, or maybe it's gone up and I actually could use less or if I approach it from a different perspective. So even though the holy grail that everyone's trying to get to is real time ability to be predictive and, and, and whatnot, and that is most certainly the purpose of our program, the learnings from retrospective analysis can't be overlooked as well, even from the sense of that they can help define and characterize the risk of an area as well as better inform your data collection going forward. So I'll put that in. Even, even retrospective is important. Huh? Mm -hmm. And I have another interesting question, and that's the only one that we can answer. And I think Yanis, I will ask for your help with that. It has to do with costs because harmonization, for example, mappings can be a very expensive exercise especially if people have to do this manually or if you need to hire someone external to do this for you. How can we use technology to reduce this cost and make the process more efficient? What do you think, Janis? 
So I mentioned something about that, so I will elaborate it a bit more. Uh, yeah, it's true that the mapping for many, many different terms used in many different uh, data elements, metadata elements, can be a very costly exercise. Uh, our approach uh, and uh, what I see that uh, can be of help to reduce and to make it more efficient is, first of all, a very good collaboration between, between the teams that know very well the data and the technology teams that can apply uh, tools to facilitate this mapping. Then we have now the text mining tools that we have uh, and the AI technology can help us very much to do in a very fast way and uh, quite efficient way, a first mapping, a first version of the mapping. And then we still need the human validation to, to make sure that we have accurate mappings. The automated mappings may have 70% accuracy or may have even 80% accuracy. It depends on the original data and the original terms and how much of the terms and training data we can have. But yes, this is one of the things that we can do to facilitate this uh, mapping. So we can process. use tools to automate uh, part of the process, but these tools have, be, have to be applied uh, hand in hand with the data experts, huh? so exactly. the, the people that understand the data. That's what I hear you say. And the domain experts, which yeah. they know the processes, uh, the, how the data was generated, all these things are very important. Guys, I know that you love this topic. We could talk for hours, but we have to wrap it up. Uh, because we promised to keep this uh, going for an hour, more or less. If you chose one highlight from our conversation, one thing that you uh, kept, you are keeping as a takeaway, or that you learned today, what would this one thing be? Joel, would you like to start? Oh, uh, I think common language is really important as we proceed forward with data collection as an industry. The common language. Alex? Yeah, I think that was a key key is common language. And another piece I, I've kind of taken away from this is the data standards that, that kind of go along with that it's scalable, repeatable. Common language means data standards. Not what I hear you say. Yanis? The one thing is uh, that I will keep is the great opportunity that I see of unlocking the value of all this uh, data, even if there is, we need to make the step of transforming it and uh, following a common language. This, I think that it's worth it to, to do it because we can unlock a lot of value. So there is a way to unlock the value. We described some of the ways today. <laughs> This is another ancient slide that I uh, had to dig out from my archives because these are not new problems that we are talking about. They are very, very old problems. Yes, we do need a common language, but the books are going to keep on coming in different formats, described in different ways. So we have to deal with this reality of putting in place harmonization pieces to help us arrive at a, maybe not a common language, everyone to be speaking at a common language, but at least use a common language when we are interpreting what we hear from many, many people. Huh? And that's my key takeaway. It was a pleasure to have you uh, with me. Thank you so much for joining this very interesting uh, conversation. I'm inviting our audience to take a look at the, one of the dashboards that we are developing that are putting together chemical contamination test results and see how they look like and then give us some feedback to help us improve them. Any last uh, comments, closing comments, Joel? No, thank you for the opportunity. It's been interesting. Alex? Well, yeah, likewise, great conversation today. Thank you. Yanis? 
Thank you so much. And again, it was an honor to, to be with such a nice panel and to have a great conversation. The honor was mine and it was a pleasure as well. Thank you. And thank you to the audience that uh, joined us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.